Hi, I uh, hope everyone's doing well. I'm going to talk about Martin Buber's I and Tao. Um, I've been thinking of this kind of as poetry week because even though Rilke is the only one who's a, you know, really a poet, so to, so to speak, um, all three of these, these uh, writings are somewhat poetic in style. So, you know, with Buber, Rilke, and Kafka, they're not challenging so much because of you know, a lot of technical jargon, but because of their sort of poetic, non-literal way of um, presenting ideas, which leaves it quite open to interpretation. Now, if you want a little bit of background biographical information on Martin Buber, uh, Angelo has a presentation and that's posted on Canvas, um, and that's quite helpful, I think. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about the first part of I and Thou, so you might want to follow along with the notes. So the main... Um, point in the first part is just to to capture this distinction between relating to things as an it the i it relation and relating to some someone else or something else as a thou okay the i thou relation so the i it relation is what what buber refers to as experience so you're the experiencing subject and everything else whether it's people uh, living things uh, inanimate objects whatever you just encounter as things right so you're the experiencing subject and they are the objects of your experience and we think of them as just sort of available for our use or they may be convenient or inconvenient for us but whatever you know they're just there to either add to our lives or take away from it or just be sit there completely neutrally um, and that relation is one that Buber describes as as monologic you know it's a monologue so you know we're kind of like the star of the show and everything else is just extras and set dressing right um, and it, there's nothing wrong with relating things to things in this way in the I it relation I mean sometimes we have to just for practical purposes I mean you need to get assistance from people for various reasons you know throughout throughout your life right and uh, that's okay there's no problem with that but um, for Buber, he wants to say that the the I thou relation is is very important to our humanity, um, and instead of just experiencing another person as as an object, we encounter them as another subject. You know, so they're like on the same level as we are when you engage in that uh, kind of encounter, and. Um, Buber refers to this kind of connection as dialogic. It's a dialogue. And we'll talk a little bit as we go along about what it means for something to be a genuine dialogue. But um, this dialogue doesn't necessarily have to be in speech, but a sense of like a, a connection or a, a relation um, that exists between you and another another being that is, is equally um, whole as, as you are. Um, even if it doesn't serve any particular purpose to, to you, it's not something that you see as just a means of achieving some kind of goal. Okay, now um, when we engage in this kind of relation, what he, he talks about as, as an encounter, there's a lot of talk that I think overlaps a little bit with um, what uh, Merleau Ponty was talking about, about you know looking at somebody um, in the eyes, looking at somebody's face and seeing through their their um, expressions and their gestures and their words, you know, just get, getting some sort of empathetic insight into um, what they're like. And it seems to me like Buber was influenced by this um, this guy uh, who's more in the realm of, of like a psychologist than a philosopher, Jacob Levy Moreno. And um, he, he talked about encounter, like the idea of, the, they used to in the 70s have these things called encounter groups, like associated with churches and self-help groups, etc. And so the idea was you're supposed to have these these face-to-face -face encounters um, and, and Moreno was kind of the pioneer of that sort of thing. And, and that seems to be like just an idea that was floating around uh, Vienna and, and around this part of Europe at this time when Buber was writing and, and maybe he, he um, was influenced to some extent by that. Now, um, I want to turn back to the subject of, uh, of a dialogue. You know, we say like, 
you can have a, a conversation with another person and not have it be a dialogue, right? You can talk to somebody where you feel like they're just waiting for their turn to talk and they talk about what they're interested in, whether it has anything to do with what you just said or not. You know, that's not, doesn't seem like a genuine dialogue. So I want you to think about this. This is something we'll try to address this week. Like, what are the characteristics of a genuine dialogue? And when you experience that with another person. Okay, and as I say, the clearest example of the I-thou relation would be like somebody you're close to, a spouse or a um, significant other, a family member, a parent, a child, etc. But those aren't the only cases. And it's also true that even with people who you really do have that kind of relationship with, you might not have that relationship all the time. You know, if you've got this person you're close to and they're like, hogging the, the the remote or whatever and they're watching something you're not interested in you know I noticed this of course a lot of people talk about this being in quarantine when you're quarantined with somebody you might have the best relationship in the world with that person but sometimes they'll be annoying right and so you might think of them as just like this person's getting in my way you know they're kind of a pain or whatever like that so you might sometimes kind of put them in the it category um, even though you're capable of seeing that person as a genuine human being. Okay, but um, it's not just the, uh, the people that you're close to that you can have this relationship with. Um, sometimes it can be with a person that you don't really know. Like just for a moment, you feel a sense of connection to another person. Um, and it could be, you know, just sometimes you're thrown in a, together in a situation, say like in, in some dramatic event where you might feel really connected to somebody who was a stranger to you moments before, or just a sense of like, you know, looking at somebody, seeing somebody eye to eye and, and just feeling that sense of their humanity. Um, then too, you can have a, um, a connection, not just to, to human beings, but to non-human animals and particularly pets. And I think I'm going to show this is Katie is my cat. She's so cute. I love her very much. And, um, I think I have a kind of an eye thou, uh, relationship with Katie and, um, and she's she's very delightful um and um yeah not just a means you know uh someone that i care about very deeply um but what about uh other going beyond you know animals that you have a special relationship can you have a, an i thou relationship with things in the natural world you know like and one of the examples that Buber gives in, in I and Thou, he talks about there are various ways that you can perceive a tree as an it. You could perceive it, you know, as a natural object. You could perceive it in terms of its physical characteristics, etc. But those are all I, it, right? Can you perceive a tree as a thou, you know? And, and I think, too, there are some people who are obviously like tree huggers, whatever, who are really into plants. And they might feel this like intense personal connection to... Um, to uh, plants that uh, they grow or when you go for a walk in the woods or things like that. Okay. Um, what about um, an inanimate object? You know, can you, can you feel that? And again, probably it's not going to just be with any old inanimate object, but one that you feel like you've been through a lot with. Like I could see somebody feeling this way about a car. Like I've had this car, I've relied on this car. We've been through all these journeys together. And, you know, I, I have like a personal attachment to it. You know, it's not just an object for me and I, you know, don't want to get rid of it, even if it's kind of old and beat up. Um, so think about that. Think about what it takes to be able to form that I thou relationship with, with another person, with an animal, with a, you know, uh, a, a aspect of the natural world, um, and, and also with God, I, again, you know, as, is it possible we might ask this question even to treat God as an it? I mean, I, I think it is. I mean, Boober would say God never is an it. God always is, you know, a, a, a entity that's not just a means for us to use. But I think certainly we're capable of thinking of God as just a means. 
and um, you know just think a little bit about what that what might be like okay um and I just wanted to talk about this just because I think it's kind of funny or interesting, this connection to the show Will and Grace. So there's this line in here. It can, however, also come about if I have both Will and Grace that considering the tree, I become bound up in relation to it. The tree is now no longer in it. And, and, and the first time I read that, I was like, Will and Grace, that's kind of funny. But it turns out that the um, one of the writers for the show, Will and Grace, or the creator of the show, um, was a, a big fan of Boober and chose the name Will and Grace because he thought this was a really beautiful idea. And, um, and, th and that's one thing that I think it's important to think about uh, how this I thou relationship comes about is it takes will in the sense like you have to be open to it you know if you're not you know you're not gonna have that experience with anybody not a spouse not a family member n nobody certainly not a tree right um so the will has to be there but also the opportunity, that's the grace part. You know, it's like you can't make it happen. You can't force it to happen. The, the option, the opportunity of entering into this kind of encounter with another person or another thing uh, has to arise. And you at the same time have to be willing to be uh, open to it. Okay, so that's where Will and Grace come in. Okay, now we might think of that I-it relation as primary, like you first, you know, just treat everything as things, as means for you, and then, you know, later on you develop this deeper uh, relationship. But um, Booper argues that it's actually the opposite, you know, and this is both in personal, individual development of a, of a single human being and uh, humanity as a whole, culturally. So for... Um, the cultural side of things, we might say, like, well, how did how did societies arise in the first place? Is like the earliest societies, what what we might uh, term as primitive societies, though, you know, I, I kind of reject that that label, but. Um, say that they started as family groups you know that built up from there so there are people who who know each other people who have a history together and who kind of like have a uh, trust and understanding with each other now as a, a, a society gets to a certain size you know you lose that kind of connection right so when you think of like a giant city you know like Hong Kong or, or Tokyo or New York or something like that say so like it's impossible to feel connected to to all of the 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 people who are living in this this giant city right so you know it's not it's not um possible to maintain that kind of familial connection but the earliest um social groupings of human beings did have that kind of that kind of intimacy, that kind of connection. Now, in a, a person's life, you know, Boober talks about like, so you start off in the womb, you know, and, and people do have experiences before birth, you know, that the sounds um, and the the aspects of their their environment, they might, you know, take in uh, even, even before birth. And um, of course, upon birth, the first thing that is important to to the newborn infant is connection with their primary caregiver. So they're interested in, in you know, the, one of the first things that, that babies are responsive to at all is human faces, you know. So they they uh, look at the, the face of their mother, father, their, whoever's taking care of that that infant and you know the voices that they hear the gestures that's what they're going to be um, attuned to they're not thinking about objects they're not even distinguishing themselves as separate from the person who's taking care of them so that I vow um, relation is primal I mean that's where we start from and it's only as we we develop and we start sort of like pushing away and you know developing our own autonomy that we we start to think of ourselves as distinct from our caregivers and start to think of objects around as being for our use okay now this 
uh, I-it relation, which again becomes more and more prevalent in the modern world as we get like larger and larger um, societies, as we get uh, with like industrialization, we get um, the tendency to treat the natural world, and this is like something that Heidegger talked about, we treat the natural world as a, as a resource, um, as a standing reserve, as he says, um, and we treat even people that way. So the, um, the effect of, of modernization is to kind of depersonalize um, the natural world, um, objects, around us and other human beings as well. And I think that that can um, lead to the where one of the worries that Buber talks about is the incredible alienation, where you can feel like totally separate from the rest of the world. And again, I, I think that that might be something that's relevant to this sort of quarantine situation where, you know, especially if you're by yourself, you might feel like really cut off from the world and it's all just, you know, completely separate from from you um, and uh, you know he, he talks about this was from the second section not from the part that I signed but I thought it was a good expression of that alienation it says at times the man shuddering at the alienation between the eye and the world comes to reflect that something is to be done and when in the grave night hour you lie wrapped by waking dream Bulwarks have fallen away, and the abyss is screaming. And note, amid your torment, there is still life. If only I got through it. If only I got through to it. But how? How? You know. So it's that like yearning for that kind of connection, that sense of sense of um, there being another subject that you're sharing the world with. Okay. Um, I talked already, just looking at some of the questions that I put on the notes, about um, some common ground between Buber and Merleau-Ponty, but that's something I'd like to think about. But as, um, in general, we've been talking about with existentialist philosophers, part of what's relevant is their um, focus on first-hand experience rather than abstract principles. So you might say there's some similarity between what Buber says and what Kant says. You know, Kant talks about, you know, we have to treat, we have a moral obligation to treat everybody, including ourselves, not just as, as means for our use, but as ends in themselves. And, you know, for Buber, it seems like he's talking about something similar to that, though he's not saying we can never treat people as mere means. Um, but, um, but, for Kant, it's so abstract, you know, it's so, you know, just based on the value of humanity in general. And um, it has no kind of like intimacy or no emotional component whatsoever. You're supposed to act out of pure uh, duty, right? It's not not based on feeling. And for, for Booper, it's all feeling. It's all experience. And um, that's, I think, the fundamental difference in terms of their approach. Now, uh, one of the suggestions, a lot of um, existentialist philosophers talk about alienation, especially alienation in the modern world. And I think in Buber you see it like a suggestion of a, uh, an answer to that. You know, like how do we um, avoid feeling alone, solitary, adrift, full of dread, etc. And for him, he says, well, we start off with our connection with other human beings, and that's the solution. You know, we have that connection to other human beings, which gives our life a sense of warmth and purpose and belonging. You know, and, and I made reference to the third season of The Sinner that it, this guy's all, you know, um, Nietzschean and, you know, using Nietzsche's philosophy to justify basically going around killing people. Um, but it, I think it, it looks at this as well as like, you know, you can see yourself as isolated and alone and like, I live alone, I die alone, but we all crave that connection, that I thou relation. And in the absence of that, everything is gonna seem kind of meaningless. Okay. Um and 
the way to have meaning in life is to 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 have the willingness to to have the will and you know you look for the grace the grace for those things to come into your life the opportunity to form those those kinds of connections okay um <laughs> Oh, I wanted to talk a little bit about spirituality. So for Buber, he associates the I-thou relation with creativity, okay? Like you you can be engaged in creativity in a purely practical way, but, you know, like the real creative um, instinct comes from this, this encounter with another subject, but also spirituality. And again, I think you can have spirituality that is kind of I, it like, where you just see it as a means to an end, you know, like I just want to, you know, have a sense of social belonging, the kind of spirituality that, um, or the kind of religiosity that, that Kierkegaard was so critical of, but true spirituality is where you forge that, that genuine connection. So you're trying to seek that genuine connection with the divine. And you'll see this in some of Rilke's poetry. I included a couple of, um, excerpts from Rilke's poetry in the notes on, on Rilke and Kafka. And I mean, it, it, it I think it really, um, dovetails with this idea of of boobers about that that personal connection with the divine and it doesn't have to even be necessarily with a um with god though um prayer would be one way of of developing this kind of relation but just the kind of um sort of communion with nature that that you might experience or even your communion with your fellow human beings could be an expression of spirituality in Boober's sense. Okay, um, do, do, do. and then the last uh, question I wanted to pose is, so we could live entirely in the world of it, treat everything as an object, and some people do that, you know, that could be a way to live your life. But could you live entirely in the world of thou, where you treat the entire world, like you're, you're treating everything around you as um, something to be encountered, something that has um, a wholeness in itself, right? Uh, and, you know, Buber says he can't do this. It's just too much. It's too, it's too intense. It's overwhelming and it's impractical. You know, and like, how are you going to, you know, eat your breakfast if you're looking at your, your eggs and you're, your, you know, you're personalizing them, you know, um, that you just couldn't get by. But I, I wonder what it would be like to to try to live as much as possible in the world of the Tao. What, what would that look like? And, and is that is that something that's even possible? So those are some things. Just think about those and we'll get a chance to talk about them later this week. All right. Um, please let me know if you have any questions um, about any of the readings or the course or assignments that are due or anything like that. All right. Thanks.